laws passed in the states to end this practice could not be enforced. That's why W.D. Boys and the NAACP increased their attempts to pass federal legislation to outlaw lynching. And there's a long history of violence in the South. Arizona today is just reflecting this heritage. It is a racist expression of a cultural legacy. Now let's talk about the psychological internalization of this racist legacy. This internalization is reinforced through methods of racial segregation. The Black Codes, or more familiarly Jim Crow laws, reinforced economic dependency and a caste system regardless of class status. See, your class is economic, while your race determines your caste status. This is continuous until the 1960s rebellion against apartheid, and it begins in the 1950s bus boycotts. But this is social control. It exists in the North, and it exists in the North, but not to such an extreme degree as in the South. So when the Great Migration did occur, northern white communities responded. Race riots began, began initiated by white communities against blacks entering their neighborhoods. East St. Louis is the classic example, but there's other examples like Tulsa, Oklahoma. But East St. Louis erupts in 1917. And 39 blacks and 29 whites are going to die in violence as whites went into black neighborhoods and killed at random. And this is the first time in history where blacks fought back. These riots occurred numerous times in the North. Now the difference in this violence than in the South was that it was random, committed by spontaneous gangs of whites. It was not a systematic hunting of white leaders as in the South. And as Malcolm X would state, Stop talking about the South. As long as you are south of Canada, you are in the South. White people do not like it when black people move into their neighborhoods. This is the difference between abolition and anti-slavery. As long as the Negroes don't move into our neighborhoods, I'll be fine. Let's take a look at a documentary film capturing the 1917 East St. Louis uprising. East St. Louis back then was an industrial boom town with all kinds of conflicts and tensions between ethnic and political groups, between workers, companies, unions, but there were plenty of jobs. When World War I cut off the flow of immigrants from Eastern Europe, companies went to the American South for a fresh supply of cheap, unskilled labor. And now these northern industrial cities had a new issue to deal with, something they called the Negro problem. Like the Eastern Europeans before them, African Americans now left home to find work and to start new lives in northern industrial cities. And they heard that if you couldn't get a job in East St. Louis, you couldn't get a job anywhere. There had always been African Americans living in the American bottoms, but their numbers were relatively small until now. You could see it every day at the East St. Louis train station the new arrivals from the South coming in such numbers that they were becoming more visible in town, in the factories, and in politics. These were loyal Lincoln Republicans anxious to vote, and Republican Party leaders were anxious to get them registered. It upsets the political balance in the, the first couple of decades, especially in that, that second decade. And, and there is, there's, there's lots of, of talk, especially in the teens, about voter fraud. The charges came from the Democrats, and during Woodrow Wilson's 1916 re-election campaign, the Justice Department investigated what was being called colonization, an alleged conspiracy to import blacks to steal elections in northern cities. One story, unsupported by evidence, but widely circulated, was a plot to have blacks vote in East St. Louis, then board a train to vote in Springfield, and a third time in Chicago. If you take the newspapers at face value, you would say the public perception was, oh yes, there was colonization. But when you start digging through the testimonies, people knew it wasn't that at all. Black folks were trickling into the city. World War I opened the floodgates. They were coming anyway for jobs, and the contemporaries knew that but people were being told they were here to steal elections, 
Labor leaders said they were here to steal jobs, and the huge numbers of newcomers were straining the local housing and services. Racial tensions continued to grow. It's not that the country was ever really at peace with itself in this era. There were race riots and labor battles like these in other cities before and after. But what happened in East St. Louis struck a national nerve. The reports of Americans killing Americans came on the same front pages as the reports of American troops in Europe fighting to save democracy. It was labor troubles at the aluminum ore plant that set the tragic events in motion. The company followed its usual practice of bringing in replacement workers to break the strikes and keep the plant in operation. But now many of the replacements were Negroes. There were white replacements too, but strike leaders made blacks the issue and the target. It becomes so um, conflated with racial animosity too. It's the way that you can organize people and organize a mob. That's what they did. In the spring of 1917, the National Guard was brought in to protect the factory and its workers. But everybody knew this was a town on the verge of a race riot. When violence flared up in May, the Guard was able to keep it under control. But East St. Louis hadn't cooled off. Tensions built fueled by unsubstantiated press reports of Negro crime waves and gun purchases, and by rumors and inflammatory public speeches. They wanted to drive the, the blacks out of East St. Louis. They wanted to make East St. Louis an all-white town. The evening of Sunday, July 1st, a car drove through a Negro neighborhood firing shots as it drove by. Later, when another car approached, shots were fired from the crowd. Maybe some thought it was the same car, but it wasn't. Police officers were in this one and two were killed. When word of what happened spread, white mobs set out to attack blacks. They beat, shot, lynched, even burned to death. Fires were set in black neighborhoods and people were shot as they tried to escape the flames. A family just up from Mississippi stepped right into the middle of it. And we just as we got to 10th Street, while we were standing, we could see different people running and hollering, colored people. And they were getting down in the weeds that they were hiding from. The, and the guy was running and shooting, didn't know what to shoot. You just see the smoke and hear the shot. That was a scary time. The daughter of former Mayor Melbourne Stevens was told to stay indoors, and she watched from her bedroom window. You could hear cars racing by and people yelling and screaming. And I could see all the fires burning. Where they'd set fire, you know, to the colored houses. I was petrified. No one will ever know for sure how many people were killed in the East St. Louis race riot of 1917. Some of the early reports were exaggerated. The official death toll was 39 blacks and 9 whites. Others accepted the higher number of 100, almost all black. They searched for bodies, but so many people couldn't be accounted for. Maybe they had crossed the bridge to St. Louis. Maybe their bodies were somewhere in the river. The nation responded with speeches, editorials, and accusations. Some blamed labor, the police, city government, industry for importing blacks. Some said whites had only acted to prevent a black uprising. In the South, many said the race riot exposed Northern hypocrisy and showed what was really awaiting southern blacks in northern cities. By the 19 teens, it was the North's turn to decide on the Negro question. And I see East St. Louis as a harbinger of, of white supremacy, northern style. Despite pressures from blacks and whites to condemn the riot, President Wilson made no statement. But Congress investigated the riot, the crimes, 
and the city of East St. Louis itself. This wasn't a black eye. This was a self-inflicted wound that would leave an ugly scar, if it ever healed at all. Okay, so 